Hello and welcome to Living Word, growing a family that experiences every promise of God. You're listening to another life-changing word from Pastor Scott Anderson. For more information, visit our website at livingwordonline.com. As we're in the middle of a series called Christus. You know, we all have different crises in our lives, some big, some small, some, some in the middle somewhere. It might be a crisis within your marriage or in a relationship or lack of a marriage or lack of a relationship. Could be a crisis in a friendship. Could be a crisis in your job. Could be a crisis with a teenager. Could be a crisis with your parents or estranged kids. And, and so we have all different levels of crisis within our health. There's all these different levels of crises that we're going through. And it's hard when we're going through them alone, but if we can learn to put Christ in our crisis, it becomes a Christus. And a Christus is a whole lot better than a crisis, amen? Even when you say it, if you tell somebody, yeah, I'm in the middle of a crisis, you can't help but say it with a smile. It's something about when God is in the middle of my storm that I know that I know that the end result is going to be amazing. And so we've been talking about what does it mean to put Christ into your crisis? What does that mean? Because whatever I put in is what I tend to get out. And if I put negativity and I put poor me and I put uh, a fear and anxiety and worry into my crisis, I tend to just reap that sort of harvest out in my future. But if I can learn to put God in, put Christ in, I seem to get different end results. But here's the thing, subconsciously or how we believe, oftentimes people think they're putting the right stuff in, but they're not. Because we have a misbelief of oftentimes what needs to go in. And we forget about what Christ really is. We become like the Israelites who just put fear and anxiety into that first generation of the promised land. And that's not who this church is going to be. I get uh, sometimes my, my staff and, and, and those they, they, the armor bearers, they'll do something special for me. They'll, they'll take my car and they'll gas it up and they'll, and they'll wash it. And so it was on a particular Sunday and at 11 o'clock they took my car. And then, you know, I teach the 11 o'clock service, and then I teach the 1 o'clock service. And so by the time I get done, around uh, 2.30, 3 o'clock, uh, I go out to my car, and, and, you know, I buy and sell cars quite a bit. And so cars changed in my life quite a bit. And so uh, they gave me the keys, and I kind of looked at them, like, eh, didn't really look like my key. And so I went over to my white uh, uh, truck there, and I, I climbed in, and I climbed in, and it, Kind of smelled like mothballs, and it, 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 right? It just had like a smell to it. I'm like, that's a horrible air freshener. That's all right. And then there was a I love cats thing hanging down. And I looked at it, I go, I don't love cats. That's weird. Right? And so, and then the steering wheel had this big old steering wheel cover on it, right? And, and I'm like, well, what kind of car wash did they take it to? And then I noticed my seats were leather. I'm like, they used to be cloth. This is a great car wash. <laughs> oh, that's nice. They bring it in. They're like air fresher, leather seats. Yeah, we can do that. Right? And I'm like, and then I, my mind was trying, like, I'm trying to figure out what's going on. And finally I go, hey, this is not my car. <laughs> and, and so I turned to the armor bearer. I said, you grabbed the wrong car. I said, no, this is your car. I said, no, it's not my car. I don't love cats for number one. There's a whole lot of things that are wrong with this car. It's not my car. And so I get the keys back, and off he goes driving with this car that has now been gone from the car wash for four hours. <laughs> and I remember saying to myself, he's going to jail. I'm not going to see him again until he can be post some bail up. It's been gone four hours. When he shows up, they're just going to lock him up. And I'm like, well, I got other things to do. And so, no, I just say, <laughs> well, come to find out when he gets there, there was my car all ready to go. And it was a, an elderly gentleman who had just been waiting for four hours, didn't complain, didn't say anything. And he's like, well, I just thought it was taking a little extra time. <laughs> That's awesome. Four hours. He's like, but I did have to be home by nine. And so I was like, and I think in the same thing, we grabbed the wrong vehicles of life out there. It may look the same on the outside, but it isn't the same. And until I learn really what the true nature of Jesus Christ is, that I can begin to put it into my life and into my storms, I continue to have these things that are improper and not working correctly. And this series is about getting you the true nature of what Christ is. And last week, number one, I think it was the big one. And we missed the mark. It was about love. 
That life is about putting love. You'd be amazed what happens when you inject love into anything. You inject love with that, that boss that you can't stand, and all of a sudden you begin to love, and you begin to just try and make them successful. And before long, you're like, yeah, I guess I kind of like them. You put love into your relationship. You put love into your friendship. put love into your parents that you haven't talked to. You begin to put love into these things in life. And when I put Christ in, I seem to always get Christ out. Number two. Today, we're going to find here in three different scriptures as we look at three different occasions here with Jesus Christ. And we're going to get a picture because oftentimes religion has portrayed Jesus as kind of a little bit wimpy, right? A little bit of a wimpy. I like that when we were, when we were in Rome and we went to the Vatican and, and we were looking at the Sistine Chapel. And, and the second portrait that he did of Jesus was this, like he was just a boom. He, was like, he wasn't like a, a real skinny, like you normally see Jesus. He was like a boom Jesus. Like, hey, been at the gym today. Anybody want to go around? Like he was a big Jesus that he painted. And this is what I like to see in our own lives, that Jesus isn't this little wimp that just seems to take it, but instead Jesus is this amazing, awesome, I am here to pump you up. Jesus, right? I don't know I did that. Right? Pump you up. All right. Watch this. There we go. Matthew 12, 42. The queen of the south, this is Jesus talking, will rise in judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. Jesus is talking. He's like, hey, you had Solomon, but guess what? Something greater than Solomon right before that. He said, you had Jonah, but something greater than Jonah is here. And it wasn't prideful, but it was more of a confidence that Jesus seemed to carry into every circumstance. Go to the next scripture for me, Bets. John 2, 15, when he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the change and the money and overturned the tables. How many people know that ain't no wimpy Jesus? Amen. Verse 19. Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. That sounds like a confident person that's saying, hey, tear it down, do what you will, but guess what? I'm going to raise this thing back up. And I wonder if some of us can learn how we talk and how we speak in the midst of our in the midst of our problems and things that are going on in our life. Go to the next scripture for me, Betts. I like this one in Luke 13, 31. On that very day, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Man, you got to get out and depart from here. For Herod, who was the king there at the time, the ruler of, the, of that area, wants to kill you. Now, here's Jesus' response to the ruler of where he was at saying, Hey, I want to kill you. He, says, he said to them, Go tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures. Today and tomorrow and the third day I shall be perfected. I like that. He said, hey, I know he wants to kill me, but it doesn't matter in the midst of this crisis. I got some stuff to do, and you ain't going to chase me out of this place. I'm going to be here for not just one day, two days, but I'm going to be here for three days. And some of us need to learn, number two, how to put some confidence and some courage in the midst of our crisis in life. Come on, somebody out there. Come on, we got to put a little confidence in. Jesus was confident. He's like, he had a bring it type attitude. He had that David type attitude, that Gideon later on type attitude when it's like, hey, this is what you got. Well, guess what? What I got. And we got to learn to have this. Now, let me give you the two definitions. I put them together because they're so close together. Courage and confidence. Courage is the state or quality of mind or spirit that enables a person to face danger Fear with self-possession, confidence, and resolution. So a crisis in life, but they have it with a confidence uh, uh, and a resolution. Go with me to uh, the next one, Betsy, confidence. A belief or conviction that an outcome will be favorable. I wonder how many of us need to put that something of our lives. No matter what happens in your day, your week, whatever, you have a confidence about you that you know that you know that there's going to be a good outcome. This is what you and I need to begin to put into whatever our crisis is, that we walk with an air of confidence. You know, you can look at someone, you can tell if they're confident or not confident. They can walk in a room and you can just tell. But those that have confidence are the ones that seem to bring to them everything that they need to have success because confidence is faith. It's a belief that the outcome is going to be favorable. Do you have that belief in whatever's going on in your life right now? Do you know that you know that you know? 
that I serve a God that's going to come through. And it isn't about me. It's Christ working through me. It's not that I have it all figured out, that I got everything that I need, but it's that David thing that says, me and my God today are going to take care of this problem, this circumstance. I know there was a layoff, but it doesn't matter because God is my supplier and he will meet my needs. It's not the world's economy that can hold me down. I'm a part of a bigger economy. I'm part of God's economy. And it's a confidence that you walk with you where you go. Peyton, when he first started wrestling, um, when he'd walk out on the mat and we'd see who he had wrestled, he's like, Dad, that kid is big. He looks like he's been wrestling for a long ways. And so when he walked out on the mat, you know, you could tell he was real timid, right? And, but now that he's been wrestling now for six years, right? You, there's a difference about Peyton. Even before the match, he'd like sit around and he'd be all kind of nervous and looking around trying to figure out. He's like, do I have to wrestle that kid, that kid? And now he's just kind of kicking back. he got a little Gatorade, got a little headphones on. He's just kind of right. And, and so this, during the season, I looked over and I came over to him and I'm like, now which kid do you, do you wrestle on this one? And he pointed over to the kid and I go, well, I thought that was the coach. That's a man. You're wrestling a man? <laughs> the one with the beard. The one that's like, hey, I got to get going. I got kids to take home and feed. I got things to do. He's like, he's like, yeah. He goes, Dad, I got this. It's no big deal. I'm like, all right. Right? And when he walks out of the mat, it's just a, a, it's a, it's a confidence that seems to come out of him. And then I was sitting in the stands. It was cute. And so another kid was talking to his dad. And he's like, I think I got to wrestle that kid. And he was pointing over at my son. He's like, he looks like a stud. And I'm like, yeah. right? There's a difference. There's a difference. And how many people know in this church, we are full of a whole bunch of studs. And if we can learn to carry ourselves with a little bit of confidence and a little bit of courage in the midst of our problem and our storm, that we are the group that says, hey, Jesus is in the bottom of the boat. This storm is going to have to stop at some point anyway. There's going to be a victory and a rainbow on the end of this whole thing that's going on. You begin to walk into your day and your week with a different mentality. There's a confidence. There's a chest type out confidence. Well, pastor, I don't have, you know, I'm missing this and I'm missing that. Look at this next scripture. I think this is pretty cool here in uh, Acts 4.13. Now, when they saw the confidence, and there's another translation uh, that says confidence, uh, Peter and John, but boldness is close enough, and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. They didn't have the training. They didn't have the education. Well, pastor, I just barely got my GED. Well, pastor, you don't know all the things that I went through. You don't know I'm not smart enough and I've never been good at this. But guess what? When I have Christ Jesus in me and I begin to walk in that faith and the confidence that it's not me, but it's Christ working through me that's going to have a victory in my life, I begin to have, and people begin to go, wow, there's something different about them. I don't know what it is, but there's something different. You and I need to learn to walk in that difference. Go to that next scripture, Betsy Foreman. Hebrews 10.35, therefore, what? No, that's not the next scripture. That's the last scripture. Uh, the next scripture is Proverbs 3.26. Proverbs 3.26, see if they get that up there. For the Lord will be your what? Come on, we can do a little better out there today. God, he'll be what? Whoa, no, that was too much. <laughs> He'll be your confidence. That's what he'll be. So it's not in me. It's not what I can do. But it's more of what Christ can do through me. I may not be that smart. That's all right. But I've been given the mind of Christ. So it's him that's given me the answers. And what, Well, I'm not that good with my tongue. Yeah, but Jesus is real good with his tongue. He knows what to say, how to say, and when to say. And so it's him talking through you. It's not in my own works and what I can do, but it's instead everything throughout the scripture is what God can do through you into your life. There's a difference in that confidence. And how many people know that confidence is attractive? It doesn't look good. When you see somebody who's attractive, you're, it's a confidence, right? There's some movie star. Queen Latifah doesn't have the body of a lot of Hollywood people out there. I'm going to say it that way right there. Yet she's a very attractive person. Why? Because of the way she carries herself. There is a confidence, right? I don't know if you know this, if you read GQ magazine, but I may not have the build of a super hot man, but I am because I have some confidence in me. That's the only way I could have got Holly. That's the only way I could have got her. She had all the six foot six, eight men all around. But guess what? It was the confidence that came out of this right here. That is pretty hot. 
And the same thing for you out there. Well, I'm not this, and I got this and that. No, no, no. The confidence is what makes you attractive. In eighth grade, I was, up into eighth grade, I was the, the bully's playground. Can we say that? I was just, everything a bully would, like if a bully could write down their wish list, it would have been this. It was everything that a bully wanted. But right before um, uh, high school uh, at Dobson High, uh, ninth grade, it was the night before, and I remember I was, I was listening to some music, and, 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 and I, was, I was looking in the mirror, and I made a decision on that night that I would never be bullied again. I just I said, I'm done. I will never do it. I am not going to put up with it ever again. And when I showed up to school the next day, I walked differently. There was, a, there was something about me that was a little bit different, a little swagger. Some of you need a little swagger in your life. There's a little swagger about me. And I remember I got to the lockers, and I, I was opening my locker, and here comes Danny Bigelow. He was my bully. He was, right, the good old Danny. Here he comes, and all of a sudden I hear, hey, little Scott. That was what Danny always called me, little Scott, right? And so I went, what'd you say? And I, I kind of walked up like that, and he kind of looked at me, and he was like, he goes, and I was just saying, what's up? I was just summer, man. And I, well, we did a little thing. And I was like, yeah, cool. It was great. It was awesome. And then he walked away. I walked away. We ended up being great friends that year. What happened? I didn't grow a single inch that summer or any summer before that. <laughs> Nothing changed physically about me. The only thing changed was a decision I made on the inside that I was going to have some courage and I was going to have some confidence. And I've never been picked on one, mo one time ever since. And some of you out there, your problems and your circumstances have been bullying you and they've been picking on you. And it is time that you make a decision today that I'm going to stand with some confidence. I'm going to stand with some courage. And whatever that storm is, you can be still right now in the name of Jesus. Man, cancer, you've got to be out of this body because this body is filled with the spirit. You can't live in this body. Diabetes be gone, and you begin to bully back the bully with some confidence and some swagger in your life. Some of you got to have some confidence in the midst of your crisis. And it's not you. It's what your daddy can do through you. Lakin uh, was about eight years old at the time, and, and uh, he was out uh, rollerblading and and a neighbor girl came over, and she was in sixth grade. She was, a little, she was older, and she, she asked if they could go rollerblading around the block. Well, I'd never let him. He'd never been around the block uh, without me before. So as a dad, I was like, mm, you got to let him grow up. And so I'm like, all right, go. I said, just go around the block and come right back. Well, off they went. Forty minutes later, no Lakin. What in the world is going on, Right. And, and so, and Holly's not home, it's just me and, and the baby, and, and so I'm annoyed. I'm annoyed at one, because I lost her child. That's, I'm annoyed at that. I'm annoyed at two, I have to go get the baby up, I got to put the baby in the car, and we got to drive around the block. I drive around the block all around, and there was no Lakin. Lakin was, the girl and the Lakin, they were gone. And so now, not courage, but fear grips my heart, not because I was worried about Lakin, but I was worried about Holly because I lost Lakin. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I lost her son. How do you have that conversation? So, so I'm like, of course, I began to pray. And I looked through the house. Maybe he came home. I didn't see him come through. And so I got in the car, and I decided to widen my search. And so I, I went a little wider around the block. I went to the next block, and then I went to the next block. And sure enough, as I'm pulling up, I see up ahead, I see Lakin, and I see the girl behind him. And she was, she was, she's like a foot and a half taller. It was really cute because he's, you know, he's eight years old, and he's like this, like, like, and she's behind him, and then there's two big old bullies, right? And they got these oranges, and they're throwing oranges at my son and the girl. But he was cute. He, like, he's all like trying to protect, and he's all being cute. And so I'm like, oh, no, heck no. <laughs> you have five foot four whirlwind all over you, boy. Right? I, I get that, I screech that car right in there. I whip the door out, right? And they, you know, they were probably seventh, eighth grade, so they were taller, but I knew I could take them. And so I would. I hopped out of that car, and so Lakin, you could tell, he's like, just leave us alone. Just leave us alone, right? And so here I come on up, and, and behind him, he doesn't see me, and all of a sudden the kids see, and they drop their oranges, and they take off running. And Lakin's so cute, because he's just like this, and then he goes, yeah, you better run. Yeah, you better run. <laughs> he turned around, hey, Dad, didn't see you there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, just taking care of some bullies is what I'm doing. <laughs> it wasn't by him, but it was something special about when his dad was with him. 
It's not with you that you're going to deal with these big problems. You weren't designed to do that. But you were designed to take on them with your Jesus Christ, with your God. Come on, somebody out there. When God is behind you, when he is for you, who can be against you? There isn't no doctor report. There's no financial report. There's no layoff. There's nothing that can happen in this life that if your daddy's with you and you walk with an air of confidence and courage, I know that I'm in a storm. But I have a confidence about me that I know that the outcome is going to be great. And if you'll learn to have that faith, come on, somebody out there. If you can learn to put that into your circumstances, it's amazing. Now go to that Hebrew scripture. Therefore, do not cast away your what? Your confidence, which has what? My reward is in my confidence. But how many times... Do something, we get negative news, and we cast it away. And right away, we're like, well, I don't know. And what about this? And what about that? And we have all these things that we throw our confidence away, and we lose out on our reward. But if I hold on to my confidence, and I hold it on, and I know that I know, and I begin to, to walk forth with that belief system, yeah, I've been looking for Mr. and Mrs. Wright for this long, but I am confident in God's word that says that he's going to bring this person to me. I don't know when, but I know that's going to happen. And I walk with more of a confidence than more of a victim mentality in this lifetime. I don't know when the, the blessing's coming, but I do know that it is coming. And I know this, God has met my need every single month. He's always come through, and he always will come through, and it's a confidence that you go into your day. It's not a woe is me. No, you can write this down because I believe this is a Scotty quote. I'm, he'll be in brainy quotes one day, but this is a Scotty quote, right? And this is how you get confidence. Confidence is this. It's an inward choice to win an inward battle to change an outward action. It's an inward choice to win an inward, because your battle is in here. In eighth grade, I had to make a choice, and I chose that I'm no longer going to be afraid of my bullies, and I'm going to stand up. I had to make an inward choice. But the battle still was inside of me, because your biggest bully in life is yourself. Your voice that tells you you can't, and you're not smart enough, and it's never going to happen, and it's never going to work out, and that person's never going to come along, and nobody likes you, and nobody wants, that is the voice of the bully and enemy that you need to shut up. You need to tell that voice, you be quiet. I have to make a decision to say, no, well, you're not smart enough. What do you mean I'm not smart enough? I've got the mind of Christ. How is that not smart enough? Well, it ain't going to work out for you. But all things work out for those that are doing the things of the Lord. Well, you can't overcome that, but that which is born of God overcomes the world. You can't have one single bully answer to me that I can't answer with a scripture. And it's the scripture and the word of God that will shut that voice up. And every time you hear something that says you can't, you keep telling, I can, I can. I will. It's going to be amazing. But then what happens from the inside out, I then have to begin to change what comes from the outside because the outside also goes in. And every word that comes out of your mouth has to be a word of confidence. It has to be a word of victory. Listen to Jesus. Everything Jesus said was always victory, was it not? He always talked good. He always built up. He always edified. He always took, talked good about himself to himself and to others. And we have to be those same type of people. Everything, oh, you look good today, and you're like, well, you know, and I got this, and you see these over here, and I don't know, and I got, no, 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 no. you see that little thing right there? Why does it do that? I don't know. I can't get rid of that little thing right there. right? And everything that comes out, is somebody's just trying to give you a compliment, but everything that comes out of you is bad. You need to be, yeah, I do look good. Thank you so much. Yeah, I look good. Yeah, right? Man, that was smart what you did. Well, I don't know. I think it was more luck. No, it wasn't. It was the mind of Christ working through you. You made a good decision. And everything that comes out of your mouth has to be positive if you want to be confident. I am hot. I am good looking. Turn to your neighbor and say, man, I am good looking. Turn to your other neighbor and say, man, I'm smart. It even, you can't say it without smiling because it's God speaking through you that he designed you the way you are and you're perfect that way. You're a one in a million. You are a priceless. Come on, somebody. You're a masterpiece. And it's time that you start talking like you are. I can do it. I will do it. I am victorious. I am smart. I am blessed. I can do all things. There's nothing that can't stop my purpose and my destiny. This body is healthy. This body is whole. This body is hot. That's what this body is. Everything that I say, everything that comes out of this mouth right here is positive because the more I say it, 
the more I believe it, then I begin to achieve it. It is a say to believe, to achieve. I'm blessed. I'm prosperous. I'm smart. I'm intelligent. I'm amazing. I'm gifted. I've got so many good characteristics about me. That should be the only things that come out of your mouth. You're not ever going to find out Jesus going, oh, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I'm smart enough. I don't know if i got the gifts. You'll never find that. But instead, everything that Christ says and speaks is always a can-do attitude. Do not cast away your confidence. And this is our last scripture. I love this right here. Go with me to uh, throw it up there, Betsy. It's Philippians 1, yeah, 128. I like it in the Message Bible the way that it says. Not flinching or dodging. Do you guys ever played that game in junior high where if you flinch, you, you got socked in the arm? Oh, Lord, it taught you not to flinch. You could hit me with a bat. I would just stand there, right? Because if you flinched, then they got to hit you in the arm as hard as they want. But when I didn't flinch, I win. And I want you to know the same thing is for in life. And the Bible tells you right here, when I don't flinch... In the slightest before the enemy and the opposition, your courage and your unity will show them what they are up against, defeat for them, victory for you, and both because of God. When I don't flinch at the sign of opposition, when I hear a, no a, a news and I just stand there in my confidence, I'm like, all right, well, God's got this. See, my parents uh, growing up. I love, at, my dad, the doctor says, hey, you had a heart attack. You didn't know about it, and you're going to be very limited for the rest of your life. And my dad goes, no, I won't. He didn't even flinch at the doctor. He said, God's going to have to heal this heart. And wouldn't you know, 12 months later, his heart was, they're like, you got a heart of a 30-year-old, right? right? He didn't even flinch when he lost his job. He came home and he said, hey, I lost my job. God's going to have to supply our needs. Let's go out to eat. He didn't even flinch when mama, when mama said, I have rheumatoid arthritis. My mom said, hey, God's going to heal me. That ain't going to happen. They said, you'll be in a wheelchair in six months. She said, no, I will not. She didn't flinch. And she was completely healed in six months. And you find out in their life that when the enemy came against, there was no flinching. And that's what I want you to be. When you hear some news and something negative and the economy, whatever comes out against you, that we are those Christians that stand in courage and we stand in confidence and we say, guess what? The God that is inside of me will overcome whatever opposition comes my way. I will not even flinch. Won't even flinch. Won't even take a step backwards. Even when I fall, I know that I will get up, as Micah says. Amen. I will get up. I may fall down this many times, but I will continue to get up and continue to get up and continue to get up. And it's a setback that just set me up for something bigger in my life. Let's be a group of people that walk with confidence this week. And every crisis you have, just put some confidence and some courage and a little swagger into whatever you're dealing with this week. You have Thank it. you so much for joining us today. I know that you were blessed and you got some things that you can add to your life. In whatever crisis you're in, you know that now it's a crisis. What a great message, putting love in, in the middle in. of your, your trial. Can you, can you tell us one more thing uh, about the message that would be for the streamers who are you know, watching? One more thing is love never fails. I said it, but I want to continue to say it. Love, love. Well, what do I do, Pastor? Love. What about this? Love. What about that? Love. Love seems to be the, the main ingredient to conquering whatever problem you are. Well, I've tried loving. Yeah, we'll try it again and continue to try it and continue to do it because it will not fail. Arguing fails. Discouragement fails. Being upset and mad, unforgiveness, all these things fail. But one thing that does not fail is always going to be love. Well, we appreciate you guys tuning in. It just means the world to us. And uh, if you want to give to this ministry and partner with us and help us reach and get this message out more and more and further and further, then I would just encourage you to donate. It's really easy to do. You can click on the screen here. You can go to Push Pay as well. That's another place you can donate. Do it online. Uh, but make sure your local church is always receiving your tithe. If you're not in a church, get in a church. That's get super it. important to be in God's house every single week, isn't it? Because church isn't something you watch. And you've got a great book. If with Father's want, Day is coming up on Father's Day is coming up. And if you want to get in the, the first uh, rapture, then you have to get the book, I guess. Okay. So this, I don't know if you knew this. This is going to get you in. This if is, you're a post-trib kind of person... Get them. You can pre-trib -trib with that this book. Is, this is a pre-tribber. <laughs> Just teasing you. Hey. That's so powerful. <laughs> this is a great Father's Day gift. It's about being more than a dad. Yeah. You know, oftentimes in, in Father, we get provide and do these things. We forget that ultimately the most important part of being a father is creating a relationship that lasts a lifetime. One that turns into a best friendship. I want when I'm 50, 60 years old, my kids still coming to me and allowing me to be an influence in their life. And this, with all the funny stories in it, are going to give you the step-by-step -step guide wow. that you need to be an incredible father. It is more a, than a father. It is a great book. How do they, how do they get it? 
How do they get it? You're going to have to call the church. Okay. To order it on Amazon. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it through our website. You can come to my house and pick one up. I don't know. There's a lot of ways to get it. Excellent. But if you want it, you'll find a way. It'll be here on Sunday, too, so you can buy it on Sunday. <laughs> be blessed. I look forward to seeing you at Wake Up, where, where we, we wake up. We do a morning Bible study every single day. We encourage you to search for that on our YouTube channel. We're going to continue wake the up. conversation. We do. We continue the conversation of this message. Be blessed.